You're very welcome to this morning's uh, Chagas Connected webinar entitled Brexit. What does it really mean for the agri-food sector in Ireland? Uh, which we are broadcasting live from Chagas Gatton uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson and I will moderate today's discussion. Uh, when I'm not a moderator for webinars, I lead the Chagas Connected program, which is an industry development program uh, within Chagas. Uh, this is our second uh, in our series of spring webinars, uh, which takes place over the next two months and offers exclusive insights into the latest developments in agricultural science, policy and practice. Uh, we have a large attendance today from across Ireland, uh, from the United Kingdom, uh, we also have viewers in Brussels and uh, as far away as uh, Uruguay. So you're all very welcome to our uh, webinar this morning. Uh, before we get started, I have a few technical <coughs> items that I'd like to go through. Uh, for some of you, this may be your first webinar to attend. Uh, so we just want to make sure that our webinar is as interactive as possible. And we encourage you to ask questions at any stage uh, during the the, uh, the question section on today's webinar sidebar. We're going to now move on to our main topic here, uh, which of course is Brexit. Uh, we know that Brexit is a, a topic which uh, is uh, something that's changing on a daily basis. And so it's, it's uh, something that uh, is going to have a huge impact on the Irish agri-food sector in particular. So uh, we know that the United Kingdom's decision and their subsidies journey to leave the European Union has been somewhat of a roller coaster. Uh, today is the 19th of March, so we are now exactly 10 days from the scheduled date of departure uh, with no withdrawal agreements. Uh, and to add to the uncertainty, uh, John, John Burko of uh, the Speaker of the British House of Commons yesterday through a rather large spanner in the British government's plans to seek a third vote on the withdrawal agreement that's in front of the, the House at the moment. So uh, with more on this, I'm delighted to be joined uh, this morning by Dr. Kevin Hanrahan, uh, Chagas Chief Economist. And we're also joined on the line uh, by Trevor Donlan, uh, who is Head of Agricultural Economics and Farm Survey Department with Chagas. Uh, Kevin is going to give us a short presentation and uh, we will deal with your questions after the presentations, but please do feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation uh, using your tab on the right hand side. Uh, but before we get started, Kevin, uh, you're very welcome to our webinar mm -hmm. for starters. Um, Kevin, before we get to your presentation, can you give us a quick reaction to uh, the remarkable developments yesterday from the House of Commons uh, with John Burko's uh, uh, pronouncement on the, uh, the, the, the third vote that uh, is being, was being planned by the, uh, the uh, Prime Minister in the UK. Yeah, it was a bit, it apparently it took the, the uh, government in the UK by surprise, but it was a, something that um, he'd been asked to make a ruling on by uh, members of Parliament. So it shouldn't have come as a complete surprise, and it is sticking with the established precedent. Um, but it does uh, make it very difficult for uh, the government in the UK to bring uh, the withdrawal agreement back to Parliament in advance of the upcoming European Council meeting in Brussels. Um, so what exactly the UK government will do it remains unclear. Um, they could, if they had the votes in the House of Parliament, basically have a standing order motion or a motion to basically change the, to basically direct the speaker to basically break with the president and to bring to allow a meaningful vote number three to come to the House of Parliament. But it appears that they don't have the vote to get the meaningful vote through um, for the third time and they don't have the votes to basically change the established precedent. So it appears they're going to have to go to Brussels and, and ask for some amount of time to figure out what it is they want to do. Uh, and it, but it's, it's unclear from the European side yet what the other member states' uh, response to that will be. So we are really in, uh, if anything, the uncertainty is, is elevated uh, and the possibility, the probability of a no deal Brexit has increased, as has the possibility of a no Brexit outcome uh, mm -hmm. has also increased. Mm -hmm. uh, what has decreased is the, any chance of, um, of the withdrawal agreement being agreed by the House of Commons and Britain leaving on the 29th of March. Uh, under the withdrawal agreement or, or leaving after some short technical delay to get uh, legislation passed in the UK that facilitates that withdrawal agreement uh, Brexit happening. 
so we're looking at um at, uh, at an extension probably that that is longer than people were talking about a few days ago uh, and the possibility of of both the no deal and the no brexit outcome probably increasing as compared to where they were okay thanks for that kevin okay so um we are going to move on to kevin's presentation now and um so i'm just going to make a quick change here so sure. uh, kevin uh will present uh, a few short slides on uh the latest developments in Brexit and what they mean for the Irish agri-food sector and uh, we should be able to answer all of your questions if we, if we have uh, sufficient time we'll, we'll endeavor to answer as many questions as possible and Trevor will join us uh, at during that questions and answers time uh, uh, during this morning we will our aim is to finish before 12 o'clock uh, so uh, do do bear with us so good morning everybody our uh, Good afternoon, depending on where you're coming from. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about a bit about the impact of Brexit. I'm not going to spend too long on the politics because um, uh, I'm an economist, uh, as is my uh, my colleague Trevor, who's also going to be uh, taking part in the question and answer session. And um, so where we how we have to date is we have a withdrawal agreement between the European Union 27 and the UK on its withdrawal from the European Union that has not yet been ratified. We had a political declaration as well on the future relationship. And we now have, uh, since last week, we've got this joint interpretive text agreed between the European Union and the UK, as well as a unilateral sort of uh, text from the UK that hasn't been agreed with the European Union, but hasn't been sort of disagreed with uh, either. Um, but all of this, these texts I mean there really are, there still are three different possible outcomes, three classes of outcomes. There is a, a Brexit deal, on the basis of the withdrawal agreement that has been reached. Um, there's a Brexit with no deal, and that has sub variants uh, as well, depending on what kind of trade policy the UK pursues or seeks to pursue in the event of a no deal. And of course, there still is the possibility, though it may be small, of, of, of Brexit not happening, of a no Brexit outcome. Um, this is a slide that but my colleague Trevor and I have been using for a number of months on, on trying to map out the possible outcomes. And we've got pictures of different members of the uh, UK Parliament sort of uh, in it. Um, and we, if we had been thinking about this in a kind of a four quadrant way of, of, of a very soft Brexit, Brexit in name only, where the UK basically stays in the single market and the customs union, but leaves the European Union legally. Um, or a soft, somewhat soft Brexit where the UK leaves the single market and the customs union, but um, agrees a deep uh, free trade agreement um that 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 retains elements perhaps of the customs union or single market membership and then two we we were we were mapping it in terms of having two uh, hard brexit outcomes where the uk leaves without a deal and the uk adopts the european union's tariff schedule uh and that has big impacts on ag agri-food trade from ireland to the, to the uk and vice versa or a version of the world where the uk again leaves with no deal but unilaterally, liberal, unilaterally liberalizes its, its ag trade policy. And that also has implications for, for obviously for Ireland and, and UK agriculture. Um, the meaningful vote in relation to the withdrawal agreement has been rejected twice. Uh, and the UK government last week, uh, in preparation for a meaningful vote three, uh, which now seems to be off the table, but never mind, uh, published its uh, proposed schedule of tariffs in the event uh, that they left without a deal. And that basically positions the UK's trade policy stance somewhere between hard Brexit A and hard Brexit B in that most tariffs within the tariff schedule of the UK are going to be going to zero. But there are important um, elements of the tariff schedule from the perspective of Irish agriculture that the UK has deemed sensitive and where it either retains the kind of tariff levels that the UK or that the European Union applies to imports from the rest of the world or uh, proposes to apply a tariff that's somewhere in the middle between zero tariffs and the and the quite high tariff levels that uh, that 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 protect the European Union market, um, and I'll go into some more detail about what those will be in a minute. Um, let's move on to the slide here. Okay, so we've already chatted a bit about this, but there's been so two so-called meaningful votes within the UK Parliament on this withdrawal agreement that was reached at a kind of a 
at a head of government level uh, between the UK and the rest of the European Union. And both of those vo votes lost by very large majorities in the House of Commons. And uh, yesterday afternoon, this guy called John Burkow, who's a Speaker of the House of Commons, has ruled that um, the next motion that would come to the House in relation to the withdrawal agreement could not be the same or substantially the same as the motions that have already been voted down by MPs. And he gave a long speech where he basically gave the sort of the background to it and it goes all the way back to 1604 apparently. So it now is very unclear as to what happens politically in the UK with the withdrawal agreement. Uh, and it's also unclear as to what the UK government will do in terms of its interactions with, with its European partners in terms of progressing the, the withdrawal of the UK from the European Union. Um, but it, imagining that we do get a withdrawal agreement of some sort, either before the end of next week, this week, uh, or uh, within a relatively short time frame that might be agreed in terms of an extension under, under Article 50. If we got a deal, that would allow for the start of negotiations on the future relationship trade and, and other types of, of relationships between the, Euro the UK and the European Union. Under the withdrawal agreement, there's a transition period until the end of 2020, and within the withdrawal agreement, there's the possibility of a once-off extension to that time frame. Okay, and then there's also the text on the on the future relationship, the political declaration that has become uh, has been given more legal standing by this joint interpretive instrument that the European Union and the UK agreed last week. Um, the declaration of the future relationship points towards the possibility, at least, of a deep and, and comprehensive future trade relationship, but it allows for a wide range of, of possible future trade outcomes, uh, ranging from a Canadian-style EU-UK free trade agreement to something like the Norway-EU relationship, which is, we've heard that the Norwegians are members of the single market, to a bespoke UK-EU FTA. Um, for the Irish audience uh, and for the audience uh, outside of Ireland who have become more familiar with uh, Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland relationships, all, all of the outcomes would have the backstop provision for Northern Ireland, for the Irish border. Uh, uh, and that back, those backstop provisions are there unless and until alternative solutions are provided. So they, that, 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 that remains part of the withdrawal agreement uh, and will be part of the, uh, of, of the future relationship between the UK uh, and the European Union. What happens if we get uh, a no deal? Well, in the event of a no deal, uh, the UK, as I said earlier, has published uh, details of its, of its future trade policy stance. And as I said already, it locates UK ag trade policy somewhere between the WTO MFN, EU MFN tariff kind of stance that, uh, that could be adopted and a, an alternative one where it unilaterally liberalizes. Okay, but what the UK has proposed is a mixture of, of basically zero tariffs on goods not produced in the UK or on goods that the UK assesses itself as being um, competitive at world prices. Um, so cereals, for example, they, the UK proposed not to put any tariffs on imports of cereals into the UK in the event of no deal. And then there are a set of goods where the UK is going to impose tariffs that are greater than zero, but that are less than the current EU MFN tariff levels. And generally speaking, these are, these are goods where the UK is a large net importer, but also has a substantial uh, level of activity in producing those goods within the UK. So, for example, uh, beef uh, is one of those products, uh, pig meat is one of those products, dairy products are, are some of these products, where, we're, where the UK proposes to levy non-zero tariffs, but to levy those tariffs at rates that are less than the, the EU um, MFN levels. And then there are a number of products, there is one particular class of products, the number of tariff lines, where, where the UK is a major producer and where it has deemed that uh, the, these products or the production sectors are politically and economically sensitive, where they are going to stick with the with the European Union levels of tariff protection in terms of the of the, the MFN tariffs that they're proposing to apply, and the lamb sector uh, is is where that's most uh, mo most most important from the Irish perspective, where the UK is proposing to stick with what are pretty high uh, tariff levels uh, within the EU tariff schedule in terms of the UK's own tariff um, uh, stance. Inside, you know, kind of. Uh, UK has also indicated that 
it will not um, at least collect tariffs on exports from Ireland to Northern Ireland or install uh, physical infrastructure to inspect goods traveling from, from the Republic of Ireland, which will remain within the, the single market uh, to, to Northern Ireland, which will be part, which obviously is part of the UK. Um, and it's committed not to be putting a, to, any, to be putting in infrastructure or staff to be to be forming a regulatory or, or regulatory checks on, on those those trade flows either. And this was initially thought uh, of as some sort of backdoor that could facilitate uh, ongoing exports of products like beef from Ireland to the United Kingdom, uh, that would in some sense avoid the, the the tariff levels that the UK was 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 proposing to to apply in the in its draft schedule. But the British government, or Her Majesty's government, has confirmed over the last number of days, in fact, that 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 will not be allowed to happen in the sense that if a if a if an importer in in Great Britain was planning to import beef from from the Republic of Ireland and route it through Northern Ireland, that that wouldn't mean that it wasn't liable for those tariffs, those taxes that, on those those import flows. So, um, you know, the, for, from Ireland's perspective, uh, there will be tariffs on trade with the UK. So, we still have only three possible outcomes in the medium to longer term. The UK leaves without a deal. The UK does not leave the European Union, i.e. Brexit doesn't happen, or the UK leaves basically with the deal that's been negotiated with the European Union. So there's three possible outcomes, but there are an awful lot of different kind of convoluted routes to those end states, okay? And there's an academic called John Worth at the College of Europe uh, who does regular updates of very interesting and complicated trade flow diagram, or flow diagrams that show the possible ways and routes to these three types of outcomes, okay? Uh, and if we have a no deal outcome, uh, any future trade deal between the European Union and the UK will almost certainly have to address, before it gets going in any meaningful way, the kind of issues that are addressed within the withdrawal agreement. So that would involve the UK settling its accounts with the European Union in terms of its budgetary contributions, uh, issues like citizens' rights, and the, the backstop issues that to date have bedeviled uh, getting an agreement on this whole process. This is just a quick screen grab of how complicated the the the, the routes and the, the probabilities are to uh, to those um, those end states, um, and you can uh, I won't dwell too long on this. You can you can uh, go to John Wirt's uh, blog and and look at all the probabilities yourself. But um, it looks like the, the likelihood of uh, the UK getting this no deal outcome or this withdrawal agreement outcome is is unlikely. So, what determines the 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 degree of the negative impact of a no deal Brexit on Irish agriculture. We'll focus on that for the rest of my, the presentation. The degree, what determines the, the degree of the negative impact is the dependence on exports to the UK of, of a given sector. Um, the, basically, the, the height of current EU MFN tariffs, i.e. The, which determined the, how good is our current preferential market access to the UK relative to other potential suppliers. Um, the dependence of a sector on, on, on the UK as a sort of a bridge to the continental European Union market is also important. And the final one is, is, the, uh, is the farm income dependence on subsidies. And of course, the extent to which the production that's ongoing in Ireland uh, at the moment is, is currently profitable. If, if, if a given activity is very profitable, it, you, can, you can imagine that it would still continue if the margin was slightly smaller, i.e lower prices would not make it unprofitable as compared to today, it would just make it less profitable so that we can, we, you know, production would continue. So next slide is uh, just going through some of the, the, the sector by sectors. The most vulnerable sector in Irish agriculture, I think, uh, certainly in our assessment is the beef market. Um, beef accounts for about 50% of our, beef exports to the UK account for 50% of our total exports and Exports account for 90% plus of our production. So the UK is almost accounting for half of our production. Um, right now, there are pretty low margins, both at the farm level and in the processing sector from beef production and beef processing. So that uh, any negative hit to the beef price as a result of Brexit would, uh, would reduce what are already very small margins uh, to even smaller and potentially negative margins. Um, there's no single member state within the European Union that could replace the UK market. They're just not of a scale really to, to absorb 
you know, going to nearly 300,000 tonnes of, of carcass weight equivalent of, like, of exports. And it's, very, it's hard to conceive of uh, world markets, uh, that non-EU markets that could absorb this, uh, this supply either uh, at current prices because Irish, Irish cost of production are much higher than some of the cost of production of competitors on the world market, such as uh, Brazil, Argentina, or Uruguay. So, so it so the beef the beef industry in Ireland is in a difficult place in the event of, of a no deal Brexit. The UK policy stance of having what are known as managing UK's imports under what are called tariff rate quota, uh, with relatively high uh, over quota tariffs, uh, would we, on our assessment, lead to a larger reduction in Irish beef prices and a large reduction in beef prices would lead to a large reduction in the profitability at the farm level and at the beef processing level. The dairy sector, which is the other pillar of Irish, uh, of Irish agriculture, uh, is less vulnerable than beef uh, to Brexit. Um, Ireland's uh, dairy uh, commodity production is in many parts of at least uh, competitive at world market prices. So uh, insofar as we depend on the UK market, uh, we can we can imagine uh, finding markets other than the UK for those products at prices that are not dramatically lower. Um, the tariffs being proposed by the UK in terms that they would impose in the in the event of a no deal outcome are not as high in, in ad valorem equivalent terms as those that they're proposing for beef, and the Irish dairy sector is on average less dependent on the UK market than it is as compared to the beef market. And finally, at the farm level uh, and most likely at the processor level as well, um, there are better margins being earned in, 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 in dairy production than in beef production. So in the event that we have a no, a no deal outcome that has negative impact on dairy prices, that negative impact will probably be smaller in percentage terms than on beef. And these in, this industry is more profitable, so it would be basically a, in a better position to absorb that negative impact on, on margins. The sheep sector, is a sort of a, a, is a bit different uh, in terms of, of where the UK is and where, where Ireland is. The UK is the largest uh, exporter of lamb in the European Union and, and in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, the Irish industry is a relatively low dependence on the UK market. Uh, and in the event of a no deal, UK lamb exports would be basically excluded from the European Union 27 market by, by, by tariffs. Uh, and there could be opportunities for Irish uh, lamb exports to replace those UK exports to uh, continental EU markets. Um, so, you know, there, there, there's a, a little hint of a bright spark for, for sheep farming uh, from Brexit, but most Irish sheep farmers are also beef farmers. Uh, they, they run mixed farms. So, on average, um, our assessment is that, that any gains on, on, from higher land prices would be more than offset by, by losses from, from lower beef prices. And just as a summary of, of, of the impacts in other sectors that people talk about in Ireland, one part of Irish agriculture, it's a very small part, uh, for example, is edible horticulture, which aka is another name for mushroom production. Um, almost all uh, of, its, of Irish mushroom production is exported to the UK. The UK is, is not proposing to impose any tariffs on mushroom uh, imports. So in some sense, the, the, that sector seems to have got out, got out of jail uh, from the Brexit uh, process. Um, but there probably would be non-tariff barriers in terms of additional customs uh, costs uh, to, be, to be dealt with. Uh, so there would be trade costs uh, incurred as compared to the, the status quo. Um, the pig tariff, the tariff and pig meat that the UK are proposing to impose again are lower than the European Union MFN tariffs and would be expected to negatively affect Irish exports of pig meat to the UK with consequences for Irish pig prices. Again, there are Irish pig exports to the world market, uh, so we are somewhat competitive on that on that market so that the um, the Brexit outcome is, is not is not as big it won't have as big an impact as, as the impact on the beef sector. There are issues about slaughter capacity in the south because we currently export lots of pigs to Northern Ireland for slaughter. Um, the industry on the island has basically developed on an on all island basis. So there would be would be a cost of, 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 of developing that capacity in, in Ireland. Poultry, similar concerns as, as, as in the pig sector, relatively low tariffs, 
but the industry is currently uh, set up basically on, on an integrated basis in, in the north and the south of Ireland. Uh, and those sort of integrated supply chains would be unlikely to survive in the event uh, that the Northern Ireland, that Northern Ireland left the single market. Finally, tillage. As I said earlier, the UK is imposing to is proposing not to impose any tariffs on 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 uh, imports from 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 anywhere basically. Um, but the European Union tariff schedule does have tariffs uh, on on imports of of grain that are that are outside of the arrangements for um, that preferential access via tariff rate quotas and so on that it has with the rest of the world. Um, so imports into Ireland from the UK of of grain would be would be tariffed, would, would have taxes imposed on it. And and that would force the, 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 the Irish economy to go looking for grain from elsewhere. And most likely that would be reflected in higher farm gate prices for, for cereals in Ireland, which is good from the perspective of Irish Jewish farmers, I guess, but is a negative from the perspective of the overall farm economy, given that most of our agriculture is a life, is livestock based and is is a, is a consumer of, of, of cereals as feed grains. So, bright spark for a bright hint of, of some positivity for tillage farmers, but that positive impact would be more than offset by the negative impact on, on users of those grains in Ireland. So that's the end of the, of the presentation. Happy to, to take questions that you, uh, that you have for the rest of our hour or whatever's left of it after I've talked. Well, it's amazing, time flies by. Um, thanks very much for that, Kevin. Uh, so just to uh, throw it out to our, our viewers this morning, we have put together a, a short poll there, and we'd be interested to get your views on uh, what uh, the likely scenario for, uh, for for Brexit is. So we have just launched our, our poll there. The question is, um, in your view, what is the, the, the most likely outcome of Brexit? Uh, so we're going to leave that poll open just for a few seconds there and just to see what the sort of response uh, is coming through. So uh, very strong uh, support here, uh, or, or, or view here, that uh, we will see an extension under Article 50, um, judging which is, by the response here. Which is interesting, but that, that just delays the, the decision point. So uh, if we get an extension under Article 50 uh, for three or nine or 21 months, um, at some point in the, the near or our, our not so distant future, we will be back to considering again, mm. are we going to have a, a an exit with a deal or an exit without a deal? Mm. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not an end state, it's, mm. it's, a, it's just a postponement of the decision about what end state we want. Yes, yeah. and of course, it's really this sense of uncertainty that is causing yep. a lot of uh, people to I suppose, suspend decisions and investment. Yep. Um, you know how you know what what's the likely impact of that prolonged uh, degree of uncertainty? Well, it's a, it's certainly negative for those uh, those firms that that would be building those um, facilities uh, that you know that, that the investment dollars are spent on basically. But um, investment is kind of one of the things that underpins economic growth. And uh, when you have um, lots of people postponing their investment decisions, that's a big negative for the economy me and for the and in, in agriculture it will be you know the the profits that could be made from extra production that would come from uh, from an investment decision say on a dairy farm uh, that won't happen that there will be postponed some point in the future so it, it is a negative uh, but it's a perfectly rational perfectly rational thing for farmers to do given the the uncertainty that 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 we are facing so to, just to, to show you what the response rate, we have 85% of our viewers this morning believe uh, that an extension will take place. 10% uh, feel that there will be a no deal and 4% uh, uh, that there will be no Brexit. Um, let's go to a few of your questions and uh, let's just take a quick look at the, the, the questions that we have uh, received here. So uh, first question to Kevin and uh, Trevor, if you're on the line, you can also, uh, Feel free to, to join in here. Um, we uh, the first question we have is it possible uh, to quantify what effect Brexit has already already had on the Irish beef industry? So this is a more of a retrospective uh, question. Uh, maybe you haven't done any particular research on this, but maybe 
you could give us a well, comment? Well, part of, you know, uh, the depreciation of, of the pound sterling since 2016 has certainly been associated with, uh, with the, the Brexit process. Uh, uh, so that has lowered the value in euros of our exports to, um, to the UK. Uh, so insofar as you mark all the movement in the exchange rate between the euro and sterling down to Brexit developments, it certainly has, had, has already had a negative impact on Irish prices. They would have been higher than they have been, most likely, uh, in a would have been higher in a world where Brexit didn't happen. Um, so that's the principal impact, I think, uh, on prices. I, 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 I think that given that meat processors are, are buying cattle for slaughter, it have been for the last number of weeks, uh, and those, those the meat from those animals will be marketed post March 29th. They have been probably paying, they have not known what tariffs or otherwise would apply to their exports of beef to the UK, so almost certainly they've been paying lower prices than they, they would have ha had in a, in a world where Brexit wasn't happening. But it's very hard to come up with a precise estimate uh, at, the, at this point as to what has already been the impact, but almost certainly it has been a negative impact. Uh, Trevor, are you on the line there? Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Uh, Trevor. Okay, okay. Trevor just just to, to look at that question from a dairy perspective, um, you know, is it possible to quantify the effect that Brexit has already had on the, the Irish dairy industry? Well, I, I think like Kevin has already referred to with respect to um, beef, the, the key issue to this point really has been uh, the exchange rate. You know, sterling is about maybe 15, 20% weaker than what it, what it would have been at um, the peak of its value, you know, which would have been uh, at something like 65 pence to the to the euro, and you know it's currently uh, in in the mid 80s. So that's the, um, the the biggest single impact from a UK perspective. Um, but as as Kevin has already outlined, um, outside of uh, the cheese sector, you know, the UK is isn't as important a, a market for dairy products uh, as would be the case for for, for beef. Thank you. So we have another question here. Uh, it, it's uh, asking here, if we get a, a deal, what will happen during and after the transition period? Do we know that at this stage? No, we don't. Well, we know what happens during the transition period. During the transition period, uh, things stay as they currently are. The UK basically stays as a in the single market in the customs union. And so there's no tariff or non-tariff barriers to trade between the UK and the European Union. So from the perspective of Irish agriculture, uh, uh, that kicks the can very, very much down the road. Um, but that transition period, uh, during that transition period, the UK and the European Union have to get down to the, the hard task of negotiating their future trade relationship. And uh, unfortunately, from the perspective of people who have gotten a bit tired of Brexit, and that's most of us at this stage, um, it ain't going away, unfortunately, uh, in the sense that we will be, together with our British friends, um, engaged in a, a problem is likely to be a quite a long process where where industry level concerns about changes to uh, existing market access will be at the heart of the negotiations so um, so we'll be becoming very familiar with the ideas of tariffs and tariff rate quotas and um, that's going to be that's going to be the new conversation if we get a withdrawal agreement and despite the fact that it's going to be mind-numbingly tedious it's a place where we really want to get to because you know if there isn't a deal then we won't be talking about the future trade relationship until we have a deal mm -hmm. um, because the European Union is not going to let the UK walk away without paying its bill uh, and certainly to this date, to date at least hasn't uh, singled out as in any way willing to let the UK basically walk away from its commitments under the Good Friday Agreement so um, we really do want to get to the point where we're able to have those conversations um, but we have to have a withdrawal agreement to begin those conversations. Okay. Um, a question here uh, asking about what farmers can do to prepare for the various scenarios that you've presented there this morning. I know there's a, a diverse set of scenarios, yeah. but is, is there uh, what, what uh, sort of advice would you be offering to, to farmers and, and indeed the wider agri food industry? At this stage, well, I think that for, for farmers, I mean, the, the, the classic kind of characterization of farmers is that they are they are price takers, and unfortunately, that doesn't isn't changed by Brexit. In fact, Brexit just highlights 
that 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 reality. And there's not an awful lot that farmers can do to influence their the prices they get for what they sell. But what they can do is uh, is 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 just hold off on on in, on big ticket investments. I think until we have greater clarity on the sort of the direction at least we're going in in terms of the future trade relationships. Um, and beyond that, I think farmers on an ongoing basis are always trying to, to lower their cost of production so that they can make a little bit, bit more money from what they're doing. And, and Brexit just basically reinforced the need to continue to do that, to try to become, become more uh, productive, basically. Uh, and the same thing goes for the food processing industry in terms of, you know, they're buying products off Irish farmers what kind of margin are they making from this from selling what they do what they make out of those farm uh, pur purchases from farmers um, and insofar as they want to get new markets to replace the uk market or stay competitive on that uk market in the new world that will be framed by by uk ag and trade policy they will have to become more competitive uh, and 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 develop new products to to gain greater access to to markets outside of the of the UK so the the competitive pressure is which is just augmented really it's just increased by, by Brexit um, so you know organizations like Chagas uh, whose job it is is basically to, to, to help farmers uh, become more productive I mean it you know it just underlines the importance of we would argue of what we do um, and it underlines the importance of farmers trying to become you know they need to start to think about how they can become more more productive with the resources they have. Mm -hmm. Basically, try to do things a little bit better so that you can lower your costs and and try to maintain your your income per unit of output. Okay. So do keep your questions coming in. We have a number of additional questions here. Um, just use your tab on the right hand side of your screen if you'd like to add a, add a question to the uh, or, or put, put for me to put a question to either to Trevor or to Kevin. Uh, question here. Um, it says. Is there a, still a possibility of a second referendum despite the vote last week? Uh, yeah, I guess there is. Uh, there is, of course. Uh, there's a possibility of a, of a second referendum, a people's vote, as it's sometimes called, or a general election within the UK. Uh, so that remains as a possibility. There's also the possibility that the UK par Parliament or the UK government, without recourse to Parliament, could revoke mm -hmm. Article 50. Um, just as just as they invoked it, mm -hmm. uh, so that remains a possibility. Um, but it seems that most uh, sort of informed ass assessments of that is that would be that, that certainly the revoking by the government uh, remains has a quite small probability. Yeah. But yeah. you know, <laughs> we live uh, in very uncertain times. The cliche, uh, so it is. It, it remains a possibility. Um, I guess the key yeah. issue um, would respect to the referendum uh, situation or a second referendum at the moment is that uh, the Labour Party in the UK hasn't really come round yet to the point where um, in a vote in the House of Commons it's actually prepared to vote in favour of a um, second referendum. So I mean there was a, a vote took place on that I think about 10 days ago and it fell well short because um, uh, it wasn't backed by the the Labour Party. I think only about 25 um, Labour MPs broke ranks to to vote uh, in favour of, a, refer of a, re a second referendum. So it's um, and it, it's problematic, I think, as well, because some of the people who would like to vote for a second re referendum still are very uncertain about doing that because they're not sure what the choices given to the electorate would actually be. And I think there's also a big fear on the far, on the part of some people that, that the outcome somehow could be um, again uh, in the same direction, i.e., a vote to leave, which would um, uh, I suppose crystallise the, the the decision to some degree, but still give no guidance as to the nature of the the, the leave. If you follow me. Yes, I mean there's a, there have been there have been. Uh, talk of a motion from uh, from members in, of the Houses of Parliament to basically have a confirmatory referendum. So in that, you know, Theresa May's deal, in inverted commas, gets passed, get, but gets, gets support of, of, of Parliament subject to it being confirmed by 
by by the UK electorate in a referendum, uh, and the alternate outcome of the of that referendum would be uh, remaining within the European Union. But as Trevor says, there would be political forces uh, within the UK that would not be very happy with that uh, that framing of the question. So again. If the framing of the question politically would be would be would be very contested. Okay. So we've got quite a few questions coming in here now. So okay. it's great to see the the uh, uh, response here from from our viewers. Uh, very briefly, Kevin, will Brexit or the potential of Brexit lead to consolidation across uh, uh, Irish farming uh, and at the exit of small farmers? Uh, more a controversial question, but. Look, it's 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 something that's on people's minds, I'm sure. Yeah, I, I think I, you know, I think Brexit it, Brexit will lead to lower prices for for many uh, of many elements of output of Irish agriculture, uh, reduced profitability of those of farming activities, and will lead to restructuring, i.e., some farmers getting out or reducing their levels of activity. So I think it will. The magnitude of that adjustment is is. Is very unclear uh, because we don't yet know what kind of Brexit we're going to have, and we and we don't know with certainty how farmers would respond. And the response or the adjustment may not be uh, focused on small farmers because most of those small farmers are already very diversified in terms of what they spend their t their time on. Um, they almost certainly have other non-ag sources of income coming into their household, uh, and a lot of the adjustment could actually. Could actually fall on on the sort of the medium-sized categories of farmers who, to this point, have remained uh, allocating more their farm, their household labour to the to the farm, and it's those type of farms where they're going to have, you know, where the the income from farming reduces, that are likely to see the biggest changes in what they spend their time on, and and maybe also actually ex exiting agriculture altogether if if they just cannot cannot make a living. Uh, in agriculture anymore, but given the the part time nature of, of an awful lot of Irish farmers, and um, they're already they're already involved in the farm and non farm economy. Brexit may push the push the needle in the dial more towards the non farm activities, but uh, I wouldn't expect an enormous structural change in the short to medium term. But it certainly will accelerate the, those those underlying forces that are leading people to to change. Uh, their 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 levels of economic activity. Okay, um, Kevin, if uh, the extension is agreed, what do you think each side will insist on as part of the rationale for the extension? Well, this is a, I mean, I'm not a political scientist, so it's 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 not really yes. a question. I'm I'm well geared up to answer, but on the basis of what the European Union has been very consistent in saying, you know, it's not going to reopen the withdrawal agreement. So I think all the focus. We'll come back to the political declaration, um, this joint interpretive text that the EU and the UK have already agreed, uh, and um, what kind of comfort uh, the British government can give to the likes of the Democratic Unionist Party that would persuade them to support uh, the, the withdrawal agreement. Uh, so, but to date, at least, um, that hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you take some of the politicians who have been voting no at their word, it's hard to see how uh, it will work, but this is politics, and and, and things things can change um, and maybe change very quickly, yeah. as we well know. Yeah. Uh, Trevor, um, we have a question here in relation to the dairy industry's future. Um, so, do you think Brexit will affect the dairy industry's future targets as set out uh, in the Foodwise 2025 strategy? Um, not to any great extent. I think, uh, you know, the type of analysis we would have done on this issue suggests that uh, in a, a world where we have uh, some form of Brexit in the future, the milk price uh, farmers would achieve is not going to be quite as high uh, as the milk price that would prevail if uh, no Brexit took place at all. I think some of the heat associated with Brexit has kind of been taken out by the publication of the tariffs by the UK in the event of a no deal in the last uh, week or so because they suggest uh, uh, a level of tariff would apply which is actually 
particularly with cheese, which again is the big concern, which would be far lower than what could have applied if uh, uh, the UK had chosen to uh, implement tariffs at the same rate as the, the EU actually does for third countries. So the, the level of uh, tariff on cheddar, I think, was only about 10% of what uh, would have been the case if um, they had chosen EU MFN tariffs. Uh, I guess this, the difficulty still remain though in terms of uh, other aspects of that Brexit, um, you know, getting product into the UK and getting product from Ireland to continental Europe for that matter, you know, some of those frictions are still going to be an issue uh, in the no deal Brexit, um, even if the tariffs on dairy products proposed by the UK are, are not very high. So, I mean, the dairy, Kevin has kind of talked about it already, but, like, but the dairy sector is in a, a completely different place from a health status perspective to actually uh, deal with uh, the, the heavy cold or flu that Brexit represents. Um, so I can see the dairy sector, largely speaking, powering through the difficulties of Brexit in a way that it's more difficult to see the, the beef sector coping with um, a difficult Brexit. Um, we, we mentioned uh, CAP uh, earlier on there, mm. and the the idea of having a prolonged extension. You know, do we have any idea what sort of impact that could have on the reform, the upcoming reform of the CAP, or uh, is, it, is, is it likely to have any impact on that? The timescales there. Well, it's already having an you know it's already having an impact on those those the, the, that particular process in the sense that it's not going to timetable. And it doesn't look like it's going to get agreed before the uh, the European elections uh, this spring. Um, so it's already had an impact. If we get a large, we get a long-term extension of our, under Article 50, the UK remains a, a member state. Uh, it'll have it'll have to continue to make its contributions as it currently does to the European Union budget, uh, and it will continue to have under under the treaties to have a role in in framing policy. Now there are some discussions that any long-term extension under Article 50 that, that member states might be asked to agree to would in some, some way or other be made conditional on the UK not basically um, acting as a debugger, like basically trying to, to trying to in a sort of uh, be, be deconstructive or non-constructive in terms of how it relates to the ongoing <laughs> European policy process, that one of which is, is cap reform. Um, so if it stays as a member, it stays contributing as a member does, as it currently does right now. So, so it, uh, you know, in that sense, nothing would change uh, okay. under an extension. So we have a, a food question. I, I think this is going to be our last question. Um, the question is, what will the impacts be for uh, food that is currently imported to Ireland through the UK? Is it likely that new routes directly from Europe will be created to reduce delays and costs of going via the UK and what will be the impact for uh, the consumer at the end of the, the, yeah. the supply chain? For the Irish consumer almost certainly it will be um, it will be inflationary in the sense of uh, uh, particularly processed food products going up in price because an awful lot of the products that are on our supermarket shelves are are manufactured in the UK and um, but people need to remember that an awful lot of those uh, food products that they are buying are actually made by multinational enterprises uh, that have manufacturing facilities outside of the UK. Um, that could uh, could be become the, the suppliers into Ireland in the event of 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 a, of a no deal outcome, where those imports into Ireland from the UK would face EU tariffs. Um, but if that kind of adjustment happens, those there will be extra costs in terms of getting those products, say, from a factory in the Netherlands to uh, to 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 consumers in Ireland as opposed to a factory somewhere in 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 the middle the midlands of England mm -hmm. to uh, to the consumers in the in, in Ireland mm -hmm. so and those costs will be will be borne by somebody maybe not all of them will be borne by Irish consumers but almost certainly some if not a lot of them will be um uh, and those prices of of the goods we buy in our shops will go up uh, as a result ha what scale of increase are we going to see it's hard to know at the moment um but you know your box of cornflakes probably will get more expensive if it has to be trucked from from a from a plant in, in continental Europe rather than a plant in, in the UK. I think um, one of the things we would point out as well, Mark, um, is that uh, some of the price changes that we're talking about here in the event of tariffs 
um, when when they're actually applied to um, basic products um, will be significant. But as the product is more processed, um, then the extent to which tariffs will actually be relevant in affecting the price of the product is probably going to be um, not as prominent. You know, it's not going to be as 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 significant. Uh, and I think there's different levels of exposure as well the, for different supermarkets. Um, some some of the, uh, you know, we don't want to name any supermarkets here in, in the context of discussion, but people can work this out for themselves. Um, some supermarkets in Ireland, operating in Ireland are much more heavily integrated in the overall UK and Ireland supply chain. Um, some other supermarkets um, are uh, have a more Europe-wide supply chain. And there are some supermarkets in Ireland as well, which have a very Ireland specific supply chain and with the dependence for, we'll say, own brand products produced in the UK market. And that's a particular vulnerability um, in that particular case, because, uh, you know, if you've got a lot of own label products and they're currently coming in from the UK, then you may need to find somebody in continental Europe to manufacture those products for you. Okay, uh, thanks for that, Trevor. Okay, look, I, I think we're going to have to wrap it up here at this stage. Um, I want to thank you all for your participation, your questions, and, and joining us here today for our uh, presentation. Uh, I want to thank uh, Kevin Hanrahan and Trevor Dunlin uh, for, for joining us here today. Uh, just to let you know, uh, we do have uh, further webinars coming up uh, from next week onwards. Uh, I'll be joined by Pierce Kelly, uh, who's head of the Beef uh, uh, Knowledge Transfer Program in Chagas to discuss uh, the profitability of the beef sector and to look at uh, the, the, the future questions that are facing the industry. Uh, we'll also have a, a, a webinar on the 9th of April looking at farm forestry, uh, cereal disease then on the 30th of April, and then uh, on the 7th of May, we'll be speaking to Noel Meehan, who has recently visited New Zealand uh, to uh, look at their uh, catchment management and water quality, and just to see some of the lessons that le Ireland could learn from that. Um, so look, I want to thank you all again for, for joining us here today. And uh, we have recorded this uh, webinar, so it will be available uh, in the next hour or so if you want to look back at any of the questions. And uh, we will also uh, happy to receive any questions if you want to submit questions to us uh, to connect it at chagas.ie and we can direct them uh, as as required uh, to the various different people here within Chagas. Uh, okay, thank you very much for your time today and uh, we encourage you to fill out a, a short survey that we've included in uh, the email that you receive shortly uh, just to be very keen to get your feedback on uh, today's uh, webinar. So thank you very much.